Welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike T. Nelson. On this podcast, we talk all about things to improve performance, add muscle, and improve body composition, all without destroying your health in the process using a flexible framework. Today on the podcast, we've got Dr. Kurt Escobar, and I think you'll really enjoy this conversation all about the wacky world of autophagy. You may have heard about autophagy in relation to longevity and fasting, and what you'll find out today is it might not be exactly what you thought based on the hype. Uh, Dr. Kurt has some great information. He just had a brand new YouTube channel, which is Biology Beards and Barbells. If you've ever met him in person, he is a large mammal with an epic beard. And he's got a website that's the same. I will link to that below, Biology Beards and Barbells. And lots of great information. Uh, what I really liked about this is not only is he a legitimate expert in the field, did his PhD in this area, uh, is currently uh, teaching and doing research. He also still works uh, as a trainer and does consulting. So he's got uh, both feet in the world of nutrition and research and autophagy exercise and also the land of practical application, which is something that I really enjoy. So it's rare you get people who are living in both of those fields that can then transfer good, solid information into useful, practical, uh, passionate things you can do to be better in the gym. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can get more from me. Go to my website, MikeTNelson.com forward slash podcast. You can see all the other podcasts. You can find other guest episodes I've done. And then if you scroll down, there'll be a way to get onto the newsletter. Which if you enjoyed this podcast, I have a lot more great information that goes out to the newsletter. Typically about five or six days a week. And work to make it somewhat entertaining and also informational. One other side note, after recording this podcast, you may have noticed we referenced a podcast with Dr. Matthew Stratton about intermittent fasting that will be out next week so stay tuned for that I don't think the out of order will affect anything per se here and then also I'll put a note from Dr. Escobar who followed up on some of the just down in the weed stuff about the fasting mimicking diet he took that for IF in one of the places so we do have a correction there and then also about one of the zoo papers looking at a higher protein IF protocol. So I'll put that follow up for those who want on the website. There'll be a link to get it just to make sure that we are actually correct. And again, it's super hard to remember the intricacies of all these studies, especially when I just called them up and said, hey, you want to do a podcast on autophagy? He said, sure. So we didn't really discuss which uh, studies to go over or anything uh, like that. So that little minor correction will be on the website. I think you'll really enjoy this podcast. Again, we talk about autophagy and training and also some intermittent fasting and how to make all of this practical. So enjoy this podcast with Dr. Kurt Escobar. Hey, welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. I'm here with Dr. Kurt Escobar. How are you today, sir? Doing well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. And you were just saying you just got back from doing a talk in Columbia, correct? Yeah, with uh, Motion Sports Nutrition. They've done some work with ISSN. They put on ISSN Columbia. I think this is going to be their sixth year in November, which I'll be down there for uh, being able to present. But they asked me to go down <clears throat> and present at their first ever, the, it's called the International meeting of sports nutrition and this is just their group themselves i was in barranquilla colombia my first time in in south america uh, actually my first time out of the country aside from mexico but uh, <laughs> it was it was a, a very good time very good conference the they do a very good job very professional put together and the speakers were very good as well a couple from different parts of colombia venezuela costa rica 
So I got to learn some stuff and, and practice my Spanish. Oh, nice. How'd that go? Yeah. It's, I've been working on it. So <laughs> it, it, it helped a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, when we go to Costa Rica and other Spanish speaking countries, my wife always laughs at me because she's your Spanish sounds like a white gringo. I'm like, yeah, what did you expect? That's yeah. like barely passable. And it's so funny because everyone we met, especially in the last trip on Costa Rica, is super, super nice. And it was interesting. Like I would try to speak Spanish in certain more touristy places. And then I was just speak English back to me. They were like, oh, nice try, but uh, it's all right. We, we got this. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, fun. Then uh, Dr. Josh Cotter isn't being too mean to you there. <laughs> nope. We're <laughs> yeah, doing well, working with some students, doing some, getting some research going. And uh, yeah, it's been nice to work with him and our other lab mate, Evan Schick. They're hmm. a good group of guys to work with. So nice. And mm -hmm. your microphone sounds just a little scratchy for some reason. I don't know. Maybe it's a connection on my end or something, but I can. <clears throat> Put it a little further away. Yeah, try that. That's a little better. Okay. Yeah. That, okay. Cool. Yeah. And then I think the topic today, we're going to talk about the wild, wacky world of autophagy. Because I did just talking to your buddy, Dr. Matthew Stratton, this morning. And okay. he said that you forgot to cite one of his papers. So he's going to send you a nasty note. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> You told me that at the conference, like, hey, man, you should have sent it to me anyway. Yeah. <laughs> How did you get into studying autophagy? And maybe you can give us a formal definition of it, because yeah. if you got on the internet, it seems like autophagy is the, the cure-all for appearing to be everything, and that if I just fast long enough, autophagy will solve all my issues. So I don't... Screw all the sports nutrition and I, I just need not to eat and I'll be good. If you just stop eating, you'll live forever. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Autophagy, just to define it on, on the front end, is you can think of it as a, a cellular recycling system. It's a degradation system. There's a couple in our cells, in humans and other animals and stuff like that. But it functions to degrade and recycle old, dysfunctional, damaged proteins, organelles, and mitochondria. It's very important in the maintenance of cellular function, cellular homeostasis. And if you expand out from the cell to the tissue, tissue function, tissue homeostasis, and the system function, homeostasis, and at the level of the human, overall health. So it's got a big role in maintaining health and preventing a number of chronic degenerative diseases and also involved in the aging process. But yeah, there's a lot of embellishment to, to <laughs> put it. But as far as how I got into it, it was really random chance. I did my undergrad at uh, Fresno State after a couple of years of junior college and not knowing what I wanted to do, but transferred to Fresno State, got into exercise physiology, got interested in exercise physiology, decided to do a master's, stayed there to work with my professors that I had a relationship with and then say, well, I really like studying exercise physiology. And at that time I was getting into exercise nutrition. I did my thesis on CrossFit and, and carbohydrate intake. Mm. So I was really into the, you know, athletic performance, sports nutrition aspect and wanted to go study that for my PhD and decided to go to UNM, University of New Mexico to work with Dr. Kirksick. Yeah. And he was the one that I was going to go work with, but right before I was about to head out that, that summer prior to the fall, I was going to start, he took a job at Lindenwood where he's mm -hmm. at now. So he was going to leave after my first semester. And so I really didn't know what I was going to do. He was the reason I was going to go. I thought about not going. I thought about taking a year off and finding another program, but on my visit there, I met a, a couple of different students and different faculty. And one of the faculties, Dr. Christine Mermier, who had a research relationship with someone in the Department of Internal Medicine, he's a, a biology guy, and he was studying heat shock proteins and autophagy. And the last couple of years prior to that, they had linked up to start doing exercise and autophagy. <clears throat> and so I had talked to her after Dr. Kirksick let me know that he was going to leave after a semester. 
and she sent me a couple papers and said, Hey, if you're interested in being involved, if you still want to come, give these papers a read and, and we can talk and discuss. And if you're interested, you can be involved in this work while you're here, if you come here. I read those papers. I had no idea what I was <laughs> I'm like VO2, lactate, RER, like those things I got, cortisol, testosterone, whatever. <laughs> but looking at my first light microscopy with the fluorescence, these green bubbles and stuff, green lights. <laughs> green like bubbles. <laughs> yeah. But it was interesting. Talked to a couple students that were doing that work and decided to go. And really, it was just pure random circumstance that I got involved in autophagy or even learned what it was at that time. Interesting. I, it's always fascinating to me how if you just keep doing stuff and try to go in one particular direction, like nothing ever really goes as planned, but yet you get to where you wanted to go. Like I, I did the same thing where I did my, you know, bachelor of arts and when did engineering did a master's in that did five years floating around in a PhD program in biomedical engineering. And then ended up leaving to go over to exercise physiology and the first day, like my two topics ended up being heart rate variability and metabolic flexibility. And mm -hmm. 15 years later, now I'm still talking about metabolic flexibility. And I probably would have never possibly gotten into it or even HRV without just switching and then going over there. And my advisor is, Hey, we got some stuff that involves math. And he's like, hey, like most of the time, you don't take a lot of math and exercise physiology, unless you're in hardcore biomechanics or some sub areas you might. And so he's looking around the table and he points, and he goes, you new math boy, whatever is your name. These are your topics now. And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> but it actually turned out to be a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it's weird how things sort out. Yeah. So what is your thought about, did you ever think autophagy would become a popular thing within fitness? Because I would imagine once you started looking at it, I'd, I might be wrong on the years, but I don't think many people were really talking about it it wasn't really a thing in fitness at that time oh. and my recollection is correct yeah <clears throat> back at that time 2014 i started my phd 2014 15 16 there was there was nothing like i said i i hadn't even heard that word before and now if you go on social media or whatever and anything fitness or nutrition you scroll long enough you're going to get something on autophagy. So <clears throat> I really didn't see that coming. Maybe I should have because I thought it was interesting. And so, oh, it's involved with exercise. It is involved with promoting the adaptations. And while I was studying that, I got into the caloric restriction literature and then into yeah. intermittent fasting potential literature when it comes to lifespan extension and promoting age-related health. Back in 2018, 19, we published a paper looking at exercise and caloric restriction, activating autophagy to promote longevity and healthy aging and things like that, <clears throat> which at that point, there really wasn't a whole lot, a uh, whole lot on it, but it caught my interest, at least as it relates to exercise and health and nutrition and stuff like that. So how the fitness business world works is the next thing mm -hmm. right and you know not all of it is bad information yeah yeah. You know? yeah but some of it can take a small bit of truth and just i guess embellish what the practical applications are which was the the main focus of my talk at uh, issn in uh, florida in june yeah what are your thoughts on the it seems at a global view you've got the although it's not as popular now the severe caloric restriction, super cut your calories, ah, don't worry about testosterone, like exercise, ah, you don't really need that many muscles that's burning too many calories, like just right. be super right. lean, super low versus kind of the other side is more, we know VO2 max is associated with longevity, lower body mass, muscle mass, grip strength. So yeah, you don't want to be a fat bastard, but you probably want to err more on the function side. Like, what can your body do? And that's going to be better for longevity. Any thoughts between sort of those two kind of opposing camps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I think if you go one end of the one end of the spectrum on the extreme or the other, usually you're probably going to ride. But yeah, yeah it, it is interesting. Some people that are really into the caloric restriction, intermittent fasting type stuff, the level of lean body mass is on the lower end. But not everyone needs to be a bodybuilder or like oh, know, totally. to, to look good at, at the beach or whatever. But like you were alluding to, the and I forget the specific numbers and impact and, and whatnot, but one of the main indicators of all-cause mortality and overall health is like the amount of lean muscle mass or lean body mm-hmm. mass that you have and the amount of strength. It's grip strength, like you mentioned, is a really good uh, marker for that and quad strength and, and things like that. So, you know, if you... The people that really go into the caloric restriction, intermittent fasting type stuff, and if it's at the loss of lean body mass, that's a little too much, a little too much. But also at the, at the other end, and I, I say I'm probably guilty of this too, because I, I do not like doing any sort of aerobic activity. <laughs> uh, I play a little basketball. Most meatheads don't like aerobic activity. The only aerobic stuff that I really do on a regular basis is I, I play basketball at the rec center on campus <laughs> once, once in a while. But yeah, having a, a, a good VO2 max, good aerobic fitness, as, as you mentioned, is it's the best biomarker for overall health and like all cause mortality. Mm-hmm. Like that. so definitely want to work to develop both of those or maintain both of those. And again, by no means am I a perfect example <laughs> of the, the cardio one. But. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's also what is the old argument of what is necessary versus sufficient, right? Because mm-hmm. it, in fitness, everyone has to go to the extreme. And I think we had the aerobic craze because that was the only, right. th- it wasn't the only thing, but it was an easy thing you could study in the lab and the advent of yeah. you know going from Douglas bags to metabolic cards to treadmills and oh look at all this cool stuff we can get and people can exercise in these confined conditions and uh, trying to measure strength training uh, it's hard we just didn't have a lot of equipment per se to do it It was the bergstrom needle was what 1963 so up until then we couldn't really poke something in muscle and take out chunks of tissue and look at it so i think we're more biased to the aerobic side that makes along the other way with more of, you know, lean body mass. And now to me, it seems like it's swinging back more, almost more to the aerobic side, but maybe more with the advent of CrossFit and cons and a little different avenue. But again, there's truth, I think, to all of it, right? You probably don't need a VO2 max of 70 milliliters per kg per minute, right? But yeah. if you're in the 20s, I think you're hosed, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably somewhere 40s maybe low 50s i mean depending on who you read what you believe and all that kind of stuff too and as there's a huge genetic component to that too so i've been able to test vo2 max on a fair amount of people and it's shocking some people who don't do a lot of cardio but still exercise their vo2 max is pretty freaking impressive yeah and then there's other people like myself who do a fair amount of aerobic stuff and not a ton it's not something i enjoy but and I just find if my aerobic capacity, my VO2 max starts getting below 43, 45, like I just don't feel as good. Like my ability to just have energy day in and day out and to train just like starts going off a cliff too. Yeah. So again, there's probably some happy medium between all these metrics as to what is best. And it's probably not an extreme on either end of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. And the, you mentioned the genetic aspect to it. Yeah. That, that, it is. There is a big genetic aspect to a lot of well, any sort of phenotype, right? Yeah. The, the, the people, like you mentioned, the example of, of someone that maybe doesn't do a lot of aerobic activity, but has a high VO2 max, despite that. And so we all know people that maybe don't lift that much or do a lot of resistance training, but they're just very muscled, right? Totally. Got that uh, genetic uh, predisposition. Yeah. And related to autophagy, do you... <laughs> I guess the basic question would be, does fasting actually increase autophagy? That is the ultimate question. Um, (laughs) Let's start with the easy ones first. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Anytime you you talk about intermittent fasting, it's, you got to think about what is the caloric context of that fasting. 
Yeah. And even the term intermittent fasting could be, we should probably back up and define what we mean by that too, because yeah. that has its own definitions of lots of stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah. Intermittent fasting generally refers to either on a daily basis or even a multi, there's lots of different protocols, but usually intermittent fasting is a practice where one fasts for a number of hours uh, per day and then feeds for a specific number of hours per day. Now, that specific 24-hour protocol <clears throat> generally refers to time-restricted feeding. Matt can, I'm sure Matt can break down all of yeah. the specific... And now it's time-restricted eating, right? we got to get the terms right because they changed it, which that annoys me to no end, but I know researchers get pissed at me because I still use TRF, but... <laughs> yeah, it's hard to keep up with all the acronyms. I know. <laughs> yeah. Basic point, you fast for a certain amount of time and then you eat for a specific amount of time. And with regard to act turning on autophagy, and actually just to back up on that point, the way that sometimes autophagy is, is presented is we need to do X, Y, Z to turn on autophagy. Or when you train like this, really, it's to turn on autophagy. And autophagy is always on. If it's not on, like, you're going to die soon. Yeah. The, there's always some baseline level that is, is going on in each of our tissues and cells and organs and whatnot. Um, and there's data to show that each cell and each tissue is going to have like different baseline rates and different responses. My dissertation, one of the aspects of my dissertation was looking at autophagy response to exercise in skeletal muscle and, and white blood cells. And even, you know, the same exercise protocol elicited a little bit different response between those tissues. But with regard to the autophagy Oh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. It's not an on and off switch is where I'm going with it. And it's the question is, can autophagy be, say, upregulated if we do certain behavior, exercise, nutrition strategies, right? And even with that, is more autophagy always a good thing? Like, that is an open question. There's data to show, and I presented this at ISSN. It was, this was in mice, but... They took several groups of mice. One group of mice, they performed like a appropriately programmed exercise protocol, aerobic resistance, and I think concurrent as well. And then another group of mice, they just like beat them up. They overtrained them. And after a number of weeks, it was the overtrained mice that had higher levels of autophagy. Hmm. While the appropriately trained mice, they got all the adaptations all the positive effects, positive outcomes of uh, each of the, the training programs, but they didn't have increased autophagy after that period of training. Increasing autophagy is not always a necessary or a good thing because autophagy can be upregulated in dysfunctional pathological conditions as well. In terms of does intermittent fasting upregulate autophagy? As far as I know, and again, I put this... ISSN presentation together pretty recently, there were only two papers that looked at, maybe Matt can correct me on that, but <laughs> um, yeah, I wish he sent me that paper when he published it. <laughs> that uh, I'll just say there's very few data to show whether or not autophagy is upregulated with intermittent fasting with or without caloric restriction in humans. The data that I'm aware with, aware of, there's two articles. One was Ramadan fasting, mm -hmm. and they didn't have any, you know, dietary caloric adherence or caloric restriction or caloric prescription. It was like ad libitum when they were able to eat. Right? Um, however, they do that with with Ramadan. I'm not familiar with the, with the practice, to be honest with you. But and the other was a time restricted feeding protocol, and there were some increased markers of autophagy, but they were measured in whole blood. So not to say that's like a bad thing, but mm -hmm. you know, it's different than maybe some of the things that people on YouTube or social media are, are saying in time to turn autophagy in fat cells or muscle or the brain or the liver or whatever. So at this point, there's some data to show that potentially it can, whereas the data show that it does, but in terms of what the actual protocol or 
prescription of fasting period and caloric restriction magnitude would be, there's not enough data to really say you should fast like this or you should eat like this to turn on autophagy, which th that's my biggest issue <laughs> is when people say you should do X, Y, Z to turn on autophagy, like, there ain't no data for that. <laughs> I have not seen that data, but the prescriptive aspect is the thing that is a little bit, I think people are getting a little over their, a little over their skis with. Yeah. And historically, especially if you look at the longevity data, which we have more of, it just doesn't translate very well to humans, right? right. If you're a nematode, Hey, wow. Caloric restriction is pretty impressive, yeah. right? If you're a fruit fly, pretty impressive if you're a mouse eh, sort of impressive if you're a chimpanzee or a primate the two main studies on that and one of them correct me if i'm wrong i think one of the research assistants felt bad for him and started feeding him halfway through the trial i think and destroyed like a multi-million dollar <laughs> trial setup uh, and then it humans so, it's like yeah the in in lower organisms Caloric restriction is a miracle. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Intervention, right? You know, like you mentioned, like a nematode or E. coli or fruit fly. Yeah, you're increasing lifespan about two or three times. But as you go up in, say, complexity, the mice, I think, is like 30 or 40, mm -hmm. 50 percent, something like that. And then, like you mentioned, the chimpanzees, non human primates, even with that, so we'll say, methodological shortcoming <laughs> uh, what they had seen was a decreased prevalence of age-related disease and then of the few long-term caloric restriction data that exist you're not extending the lifespan but you are reducing age-related disease like mm -hmm. diabetes heart disease neurodegenerative disease stuff like that which that's not to downplay that because that yeah that's, totally yeah, like that's as important as anything right but in terms of living longer and adding years to your life, you won't die earlier. So there's, you can look at it that way, but it's much less of a pronounced effect in humans compared to some of the other model organisms that caloric restriction and other methods of autophagy enhancement that research has shown. Yeah. And that's why I bring it up because I have my doubts about the, transfer of that in especially in autophagy to humans and maybe it isn't like you said we have very limited data but historically speaking as you get more complex to humans like human homeostasis just tends to ruin most things and mm -hmm. then you've got species specific stuff like i remember i did a whole book chapter for the issn years ago on essential fatty acids and had a whole thing in there about cla and mice is freaking amazing like a massive body recomposition effects or an over-the-counter dietary supplement and in humans the data is just so unimpressive you're like oh look at all this rodent data this is gonna be amazing and you look at the human trials and you're just like like a kilogram over six months uh, fat loss just you still wish you were a rat. Yeah, yeah if you're a rat it's amazing <laughs> yeah. yeah and that's not to throw any shade at animal research or even like cell culture. Oh, research. no. Yeah, I, I did a little cell culture research at UNM mm -hmm. and trying to get that going here in, at, at Long Beach. But yeah, the translatability from one model to the human model is uh, can be real dicey sometimes. Yeah, and obviously the benefit of cell cultures and animal studies is you can do a lot of things you can do in humans too. So like you said, it's not all bad and it's obviously a good starting point. You can do some mechanistic stuff and it's cheaper. It's way easier to manage than those pesky humans and recruitment and all the hoops you have to go through for very good reasons and ethics and all the stuff we want to do, which I agree with. It's just more effort. So there's a time and a, a place for it. I just get nervous when people make that jump, not you specifically, but People on the internet of, look at all this data, and they, they don't tell you that this was in a freaking nematode or a rat, and they're assuming that this effect is going to show up in humans, and then the data we have in humans just doesn't match that at all. That just annoys me to no end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and talking about the, the rodent data, I know there's a new Ninja Turtles movie out. Which oh, there you go. 
And I could imagine Master Splinter doing some sort of intermittent fast. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good point. And I gave an example of that in my talk at, at ISSN. I found something on YouTube or some website or something. And they had cited a paper that showed autophagy was increased to a greater degree when exercise was performed in the fasted state. And that was pretty much all the, the information and context I was given in, in that specific, I think it was a blog or something. <clears throat> I was like, okay, that's interesting. So I looked up the paper. I had read the paper before. I, I knew that paper. What, they, what the person didn't put in that blog or the, the YouTube thing was, it was in mice, right? So not humans. Presumably his audience is are humans, <laughs> uh, not Master Splinter. But... And then the other thing was he, they took that finding that was, in, again, rodents, that autophagy was upregulated more as fasted exercise, and then took that and said, so you should perform exercise in a fasted state so you can upre- upregulate autophagy more so you can burn more fat. Oh, wow. That's right. A... <laughs> right. A, a couple of logical fallacies or whatever the fallacy hierarchy is. A couple yeah. wrong wrong steps of thinking but they didn't measure autophagy in adipose tissue so i i can't remember i think it was muscle that was so to say something's going to happen in fat cells when they didn't measure something in fat cells in a different tissue and then to relate that to changes in body composition that's just one you got the model wrong two you got the (laughs) tissue wrong and three you got the outcome wrong but it sounds sexy it does (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know. And that's why that's why it's done. That's the hustle. <laughs> yeah, I call that the LOL effect, the leapers of logic. And we yeah. just jump over these massive caverns, cavernous holes. And I'm okay for extrapolation of research because, yeah, especially if you're trying to make it practical, there's not a lot of human studies, there's less on athletes, all that kind of stuff. But out loud, at least say what you're doing. Say, hey, in this animal data, here's what we saw. This doesn't mean it's going to transfer to humans, but if there's not really much of a negative downside, hey, if you want to try it, go for it. That's fine with me. But like you said, when you're getting mechanisms just skipped over and in the wrong tissue and from an animal and you're just doing it to sound kind of sexy, it's like, oh, come on, man. (laughs) Yeah. And there's a lot of that. I'm not on, I'm not on social media. I got Instagram or TikTok, or whatever. And I'm, I'm very, I'm not big into, I'm not really into like fitness, YouTube, but there's a couple people that I'll check out. Obviously you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't want to, I don't want to say it's like a gimmick, but it's like a, you say something very like scientific to make it sound like what your knowledge or your program or whatever it is that you're selling or whatever it is you're promoting is different than, than everything else. Yeah. You've got the secret protocol. I've got the secret method, the secret, whatever to anti-age and longevity and reach your greatest goals and, and all of that, which like you were saying, the mechanisms are important. They're how things happen, but in terms of focusing on a mechanism rather than the outcome as a practitioner, like you're missing the point if you're doing that, right? My entire adult life, I've done personal training. So during my undergrad, my master's, except during my PhD, I wasn't doing personal training at that time. But even now I'm working with people. I'm working with older adults right now. And and if you're working with someone, how you get to their goal or their uh, desired outcome, like they don't care. No, (laughs) not usually. Yeah, yeah. All all they care about is getting stronger, improving their body composition, lowering their blood pressure, improving their, reducing their blood pressure medication, improving their A1C, right? And so as a practitioner, knowing the mechanisms, knowing the physiology behind it is like important, right? It's very good. It gives you a rationale as to why you might do a certain thing with a certain individual, with a certain client. But at the end of the day, if you're trying to take, if you're trying to get your 
guidance and your information in terms of how to work with people from mechanistic data, it ain't going to work. <laughs> what you want to look at and want to focus on is what are effective training protocols? What are effective dietary interventions? What are effective supplements for the desired outcome for this individual, right? And client education is important. Some individuals are very interested in some of the science and physiology and if you can speak to that and answer their questions, that goes a long way in terms of them feeling confident and comfortable with you. But at the end of the day, it's just, are they getting to their goals? And trying to bamboozle them with LC32 lipidation and P62 sequestral <laughs> one and lysosomal degradation, like that ain't going to get them to their goal. Yeah, that's, I've often joked that if I have a client here and I've got 17 randomized controlled studies that says they shouldn't have been able to get the result that they just got. <laughs> they don't give a shit about any of those studies, right? Cause they already got the thing that they got. Right. And I may wonder what the hell is going on. Are they some freak outlier or like what's going on? Why it doesn't match up. But again, it's a research gives you the direction. Me search gives you the answer. I think I stole that from Sean Casey. Like you should know the research, like you're going to be better off for it. You're going to probably get to things that are more effective for clients to get them to a better result. But most of my clients don't care about that. They care that I care about it, yeah, but yeah. they don't specifically care. And a lot of people I work with are trainers, so they may have more questions than most people because they are trying to understand the process too. But I think there's this sort of myth that if we understand mechanisms more will get better outputs and my argument is that imagine the physiology is still very much like a black box if we understand the mechanism a little bit to me that tells you what other input should you put in the box to get a different output that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to magically give you this output it may get you closer to something else but you still have to put a different input into the box i think there's this thing where if we always try to figure out how the box is working, we'll get better outcomes where I think most people do better at looking at simply, I put in this input, I got this output. Okay, I put in this input, I got this output. Okay, don't worry so much about what's in the box. That's important, but I think there's just something so sexy about having to name it with a mechanism that we get caught up in that too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I would say in my younger days, I would get caught up in that too, because you know, if you're younger and trying to prove yourself and trying to uh, establish yourself and your confidence, whatever, you might, I might have over, overburdened some of my clients with some physiological. Oh, I definitely did. You I beat I mean? the crap out of the poor bastards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They got worse results. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's uh, like you say, it's the output. That's why people are coming to you. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's the output. And one thing the one of the, the talks I gave in, in Colombia a couple of days ago was a, a variation of my talk that I gave at, at ISSN. And as I was you know, revising it and, and tweaking it, I, I came up with a nice closing line to it. And, and I wish I thought of that for ISSN in, in June, but <laughs> The, the idea was, again, it's not about targeting a mechanism. It's about targeting the outcome. And if you target the outcome, right? So if you train effectively, if you eat effectively and healthfully and whatnot, whether that's caloric restriction or intermittent fasting or TRE, or I'll ask Matt what all the acronyms are. But if you're doing the right things to get the outcome, autophagy is going to be activated much as it needs to be. You know what I mean? Rather than focusing on activating autophagies, focus on the outcome. And if autophagy is involved to what a degree, whatever degree it needs to be, like it's going to be. Yeah. That's like, I sometimes get reams of metabolic heart data or high end data from a lot of athletes or random people on the internet. And sometimes I'll just ask them, I'm looking through all of it and I'm like, what was your output? Like you just did this fancy whatever test. You have a metabolic cart. You've got five moxies strapped to them. Cool. That's awesome. Did they row faster? <laughs> what was the outcome of all this? And a lot of times they're like, I don't know. I forgot to look because you get so hung up in the, 
the mechanism and figuring out what their rate limiter is and what the blood flow or century eliminated or who knows what. It's like, you need to know, did they do better or not? Because I could give you some half-baked answer, but it's not going to really mean a whole lot. Or if you do the inverse, if you have very little technology, like for training, I still write my stuff down in an old school training notebook and I monitor mm -hmm. volume, density, and intensity. And if it's going up in my key lifts, I'm probably doing something right. It never goes as fast as what you want, but if you're doing some output, just see what the output is. And if it's getting better over time, and again, it's not going to always increase linearly, it's going to be ups and downs. You're probably doing more things right than wrong. And then then that's good. And then you can get fancier if you want, which I love technology. I've got freaking Moxie. I have a freaking metabolic card at my house. I use in the garage. It's nice. great, but you have to still remember like the output, because especially if you're a trainer, that's literally what's going to be paying your bills. And that's what clients are paying for. Right. Yeah. If strength is going up and if speed is going up or lean body mass is going up, you're not really caring about how much phosphorylation at P70s, S6K, <laughs> you know, super insight, whatever is, is going on. Yeah. The last couple of questions on autophagy. If you were, so one of the things I heard on the internet, and I spent all of five minutes to pull up these questions, so forgive me. <laughs> I was um, probably five many minutes on a topic. Yeah, I was. I actually find, I do put stuff out on social media, but I find I've, I try not to consume as much social media because I, oof, I had, yeah, it doesn't do well for my psyche. But the rumor was, I won't say who said it, but very credible person that if you fast for longer, especially like you start getting into a three day fast. So by fasting here, we're saying consumption of only water, maybe electrolytes, no food, that you have a different type of autophagy, that it's a chaperone mediated autophagy. Mm. And that, may be more beneficial than the normal, my air quotes here, autophagy you get for just fasting for 24 to 48 hours. That I do not know. Okay. I, I, that was a new one for me too. It, it sounds cool, yeah. but this isn't my area either. <laughs> yeah. And, and even distinguishing between what's the, say again, the outcomes, the health outcomes, the functional outcomes of chaperone mediated autophagy versus say macro autophagy i'm not familiar with and whether or not that can be say selectively upregulated by different fasting periods i'm not sure as well yeah yeah i might have to do some research on that seemed a little suspect one other related question and i've batted this around in my own head for a while at some point, so if your goal is to gain more lean body mass, we know that calories are going to help. Lifting heavy stuff is going to help. Protein is also going to help. Do you think there's going to be at some point a downside to being in more of a quote, my little air quotes here, anabolic state most of the time continually? So you're having your five meals of 20 to 40 grams of protein. You're constantly stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Your body comp's not crazy. You're trying to gain more mass. So you're definitely in a caloric surplus. I guess my bias is, I don't know, because exercise is so protective, but I do wonder at some point if there is a threshold where he'd be doing a day of fasting for just overall health benefits, lowering insulin, maybe possibly not running muscle protein synthesis, still lifting, still being active. Maybe there might be a benefit to that. And I know that's incredibly out on a extremely theoretical branch <laughs> at this point. No, there's actually some nice data on that of, <clears throat> I can't remember the, the entire specifics of it, but even doing, it was something along the lines of one 24 hour fast, like once every, I want to say either like once every one, two, or maybe even three months, it, it was something really not aggressive. Well, 25 yeah, yeah. aggressive, but not super, super intense or frequent that, that improved a number of metabolic health markers, hmm. just one 24 hour fast every like one, two or, or three months. I can't remember the specifics of it, but yeah. So even, even something as infrequent as that 
can improve health. Now, in terms of balancing or, or with respect to you know, trying to gain lean body mass and, and being anabolic and muscle protein synthesis and <clears throat> things like that, yeah, the, the, the concern or a concern would be is mTOR activation, mm-hmm. right? Because unregulated or dysregulated or hyperactive mTOR chronically elevated is associated with number of diseases and aging and cancer and things like that. So the idea, at least some might hypothesize, is that if you're eating a higher protein diet or if you're doing a lot of resistance training, you're turning on mTOR with each protein meal if it's sufficient enough in quality and quantity, obviously. Yep. And then increasing protein synthesis with resistance training. Is that pro-aging? Is that pro-cancerous? And again, mechanistically, you could make that logical argument. But again, you've got to look at the actual outcome data. And individuals that are having, you know, let's say, a, a higher a- or adequate protein intake, and then also people that resistance train regularly and have a good amount of lean body mass on, they're in good health. Right? Yeah. They've got good longevity markers and metabolic health markers and functional uh, outcomes. And the, the thing to distinguish between, say, chronically dysregulated hyperactive mTOR that's present in like cancer or, or you know, even in some cases of uh, other diseases is the mTOR activation that comes with protein ingestion or that comes with resistance training is transient, right? It's temporary. And so if you consume a protein meal sufficient, again, in, in, in quality and quantity, yeah, you're turning on mTOR, right? You're turning on protein synthesis, but that's only for a couple hours, right? And then also with regard to resistance training, if you're resistance training every day or five days out of the week, all mTOR is on, but again, it's temporary, it's transient. I think the data on that is you know, between 24 and 48 hours, depending on, say, the intensity and the, the, the rigor of the the training, but also and how new you are to training if you're newer seasoned, yeah, but yeah, exactly. And that's tissue specific though. And that's specifically yeah. muscle tissue. So that's different than you resist the training and turn mTOR on in like your liver or your brain and you're going to get Alzheimer's or whatever. Right. Yeah. That was when I first started getting into the, the, the caloric restriction and autophagy and mTOR. I was like, well, if mTOR is bad, uh, the protein intake and resistance training. But again, there's a couple of disconnected dots in, in time, regular resistance training and, and lean body mass and, and adequate protein to, to make it a bad thing. Like the outcome data, again, are, are not there for that. The, the, they'd be the opposite. Yeah. And that's, I generally agree. Like I said, I have made recommendations to people who are on the bleeding edge of, I want more muscle. I want more performance, but I really want to maximize longevity like your grip strength is good, your lower body mass is good, your VO2 max is good, you're not doing any crazy lifestyle stuff, your doc's watching your blood work, like what else can I do? It's, I would say maybe do a longer fast once every other week. I don't think you're going to lose any appreciable amount of muscle mass. I do think you're going to drop insulin, you're going to lower blood glucose, maybe you stop or turn off my little air quotes here again, slow down mTOR for one day. Does that reset something? I don't know, but I have recommended that and again highly theoretical. My thought being there may be some upside. We don't know yet. I don't think they're going to lose any body mass. They're not going to lose view. They're not going to lose. I don't think any other metric that we know is important. And so I'm like, eh, hedge your bets in that direction. Again, and I point to any hard data that says, Oh, this is the most amazing protocol ever. No. Yeah. Again, doing some sort of fast, even if it's relatively infrequent can have some positive health effects. Yeah. And then there's also good data, interesting data. Grant Tinsley has done some work on this of resistance training outcomes during intermittent fasting and time restricted feeding. Mm-hmm. And from what I can recall is you can maintain for sure and still put on uh, lean body mass and some strength with time restricted feeding. Although I think there are some data indicating there was a paper that just came out actually with a group that I collaborate, I've collaborated with, that they seem to show, that the data seem to show that 
so to maximize at least strength in this particular paper, uh, training during the feeding time may be more beneficial than training during the fasting time. Yeah. And, I, yeah. and again, I'm sure Matt can give a whole 45 minute presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that kind of just, and I actually just talked to Matt today. We talked a little bit about that too. So it'll be in the previous podcast. People I'll link to it. And it just, I don't know. I talked to him about this too. Maybe you've noticed it is that I think you can, increase strength you can probably gain some lean body mass if you're slowly decreasing calories but mm, right, it just seems right. the longer you've been training if you want to maximize everything strength and lean body mass man being in a caloric surplus is magical <laughs> yeah no definitely yeah and that was one thing that I, I didn't add to that that last point was it seems you can still put on lean body mass while doing intermittent fasting, but not likely to the same extent if you were to not be doing intermittent Correct. fasting and not being a caloric, with caloric deficit for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that kind of matches what I've talked to a lot of high level coaches too, where they're like, if they have a weight class athlete, one guy I know in particular, I won't say his name because it may not be public, but is they took the same weight class athlete and they purposely had him in a lower calories because he was at the upper end of his weight class. He was still getting stronger, but they, they just couldn't afford for him to add any more size. He's already relatively lean as it was. So you couldn't really drop a whole lot of body fat and he wanted to go up a weight class. And I think it was a natural athlete who was tested. He gained 20 pounds, I think in a year, but this is a guy who had been purposely underfeeding for mm -hmm probably four years still exercising hard and again that's one of those outliers where people will hear that and they're like oh my god that's crazy but again it's context and everything else like he his body was just probably just needing calories and he was not getting them on purpose because he didn't couldn't afford to add any more tissue right right yeah awesome as we wrap up what are some of your research projects you're working on now yeah, <clears throat> got a couple of things going on right now and then getting going soon. One of them, working with a couple of, of grad students. Yeah. Mark it out here. Oh, you're back. You said you're working with a couple of grad students. Okay. Yeah, working with a couple of grad students on post-activation. It's not post-activation potentiation. It's post-activation performance enhancement. Is, is that a new thing or did they just change the term again? And I don't know about it. I think uh, my student told me this. Uh, <laughs> I, I think they changed the name because this type of work, uh, like cars, we're not measuring motor unit activation. Okay. Performance, the performance enhancement. So at least in this context, that's more appropriate. But so we're looking at an isometric protocol and a dynamic protocol with and without caffeine oh interesting yeah and then another one another another grad student also from fresno state so we got the the bulldog bulldog uh magic going uh we're gonna look at the effect of creatine supplementation on the acute insulin sensitivity glucose uptake response to exercise oh yeah huh. so that's very cool We'll get that going this year here. Out of curiosity, what dose of caffeine are you using? We are using six milligrams per kilogram. Okay. So you're going right to the, the high end. <laughs> yeah. If there's an effect, we want to see it. Yeah. 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 So for listeners, like most of the effect of strength and power of caffeine is going to be three megs per kg to six megs per kg. So if you're a 220 pound athlete, you're a hundred kilograms at six you're going to be at 600 milligrams which is about three no dose so it's a pretty stout dose but yeah no that'll be cool i'm excited to hear what you find with those studies yeah looking forward to getting those going and, and finished up so awesome thank you so much for all your time here uh let us know where uh, people can find you i don't know if you're taking any graduate students i know you're not a lot on social media so maybe you just want to appear hidden in the lab somewhere and they have to find you in person at issn but uh, yeah let us know 
Yeah, we're always looking for grad students in our, our master's program of exercise science. So if you're interested in studying some of the stuff that I've talked about here, we've also got people that do biomechanics, motor control. So a lot of different interests, a lot of different areas in our program. So check us out at uh, Cal State Long Beach uh, Exercise Science Program. Our lab, Dr. Cotter and Dr. Schick and I, we, the lab has an Instagram. It's the nice. Physiology of Exercise and Sport Lab, or PEX Lab, P-E-X-S Lab. So there's some stuff on there, to, so check that out. But one thing I am currently working on between numbers of, of stuff, including the, the start of the semester, is I'm starting to make, I'm going to do a YouTube channel podcast. So oh, nice. gonna, you have inspired me. Oh, Talk wow. That's scary. Oh, that's good. I think you'll have really good stuff. Yeah. So I'm not sure when this is going to go up, but by August 18th, which would be tomorrow, I'm going to post at least part one of a video on autophagy. And so some of the stuff that we talked nice. about here, I'm working on a video on that. I don't have it completely done, still working on it, but I have part one. So I just want to get that up. And if people are interested in hearing more about autophagy, they can check that out. And then the rest of the video is in production and we'll continue to do some stuff that hopefully people find interesting and, and useful. So cool. That's awesome. So you're doing a YouTube channel and a podcast or are they one in the same thing? Kind of one in the same. I want to do smaller videos where it's just a couple minutes of here's a paper or here's a topic. But then what I'm doing with this autophagy thing, that'll be probably like 45 minutes to an hour long. And then also what you do is interviewing and, and talking to other people in the field, researchers and having good, interesting conversations that people can learn a lot from. I have been watching your stuff. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. And that's called Biology Beards and Barbells. Oh, there we go. I like yeah. the title. <laughs> the YouTube channel is up. I'll get the video up soon by the 18th of August. And then also I've got a website by the same name. So if people want to check that out. Yeah, we'll definitely link to it. And similar to what our buddy, Dr. Andy Galpin has done too, with his kind of five minute and 25 minute and longer mm. videos too. It's a cool idea where you get little short snippets of something. And then if people are interested, they can dive into longer material because as you're trying to greatly simplify complex topics into a 30 second reel on Instagram, like if I get one more direct message from someone who wants to do videos for me, who's just telling me that I need to do 20 second videos, I'm going to scream. It's okay. What can I really get across in 30 seconds? Uh, maybe some extras from a podcast, you know, some stuff like that to get them interested in the long form. That, that's cool. But yeah. to get a concept across and then expect on a business side, that's going to transfer into a 30 hour certification. I'm trying to sell them like, yeah, get right. lost. <laughs> yeah yeah if you got to maintain your sanity and social media is definitely a test of that yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so i also think of it as the nice part i do about doing mostly newsletter and social media as a side note it's i don't have to make any money from social media if it works great if it doesn't whatever but it's not like the, the core of my business either yeah i'm all right with it if yeah, i get I'm less views whatever so again you're not trying to be liver king? No, it's just <laughs> the last thing as we wrap up, like you see the people who have been somewhat successful on social media or just in general. And then you, I often wonder if they continue to be successful, they've pigeonholed themselves so far into right. one area. It's like they're stuck. Like they either have to admit they were wrong or they screwed up, or they're going to go a different direction, or they just like, which most of them do, they just double down on that thing only. I just wonder how many of them just secretly hate their life. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good question. Yeah. And it, it's maybe just one point to follow up on that. Yeah. It does a disservice to people. Oh, well. totally. Yeah. Because to the kind of what you're alluding to, what can you get across in, in 30 seconds? It's hard to get something across in 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> and a lot of people, they're not formally educated. They're not familiar with the literature yeah. or the research. And individuals are not really in a position to assess the quality of the data that's being presented to them. And they just go with whatever this 
person says, this influencer says, this you know, doctor says, or whatever they do, I'm going to do. And then it's, and then they get into a situation where now the person that they follow is doing something different. <laughs> so, so now I'm going to do that. And then they reverse their perspective on something. Oh, now I'm going to do that. It's, I don't think it's a good strategy to base your definitely exercise and, and nutrition habits around, but I think people like yourself and others that do a good job of putting out quality content is, is definitely can go a long way once it gets to people. Yeah. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. And that's one of the reasons why so far to date, I'm not saying I will forever. I don't have any sponsors on the podcast other than my own business. Like mm-hmm. I've had a few offers and I'm just like, no, I'm not saying I'll never do it. I'm just saying it would have to really fit with what I'm doing or something I'm probably already doing. Even yeah. in that, it's maybe I'll think about it. And the good part then is, yeah, you can just say whatever you want, do whatever. And if it works, great. And you, I can decide who I want to bring on like yourself, have good conversations, get actual data from someone who's looked at the particular researcher in it and is also a practitioner. And that, yeah, that makes me feel more warm and fuzzy. And and it's just more fun. <laughs> if you're waiting for a cryptocurrency to come and hey, Dr. Mike, will you sponsor our crypto? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last one I turned down was the trimmer for your private parts. So I said, no. They said they're going to yeah. send me five of them. And I'm like, what am I going to do with five of them? That's my sponsorship. Yeah. I get lost. <laughs> that might bring up some questions about your anatomy, Dr. Mike. <laughs> I know. It's like, how do I. I get it. And some people I know do that as sponsorship for the podcast because there is, a, there is hard cost. You have someone who helps with all the production and the servers and right. the software. And I get it. There's a cost involved. It's not just free, but yeah, I think everyone has to decide what is that line and where, how far they're going to go on that. And then that's their own personal decision. So yeah, yeah. I just, to me, I'm like, I just can't, I, I don't want to do that ad and I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> But for you, maybe beard trimmers are great. Like, we'll, we'll send them over to your podcast. Maybe they can be a yeah. sponsor there. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for all your time today and all your great knowledge. I really appreciate it. And we'll make sure to link to all those below and would highly encourage everyone to check it out and uh, watch out for that Josh Cotter guy. He's a sneaky one. <laughs> yep. Yep. Cool. All right. Cool, man. Thanks. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Really appreciate it. A huge thanks, Dr. Kurt Escobar, for being on the podcast. Like I said, we'll link to his YouTube channel and his website if you want more information from him. You want to go deeper on some of the topics here. As I mentioned, there'll be a slight correction that'll be on the website there with reference to some of the studies and the follow-ups. And then stay tuned next week for the intermittent fasting episode from Dr. Matthew Stratton, which will be out next week. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this, check out all the other podcasts I've done and get on to the daily newsletter list. And we send you good information that's hopefully somewhat entertaining. They're usually not too long. Sometimes they get a a little bit more lengthy. But always trying to make it practical for you to add more performance, improve your body composition, and add some muscle. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We'll talk to all of you next week. You know something? That was a sweet number. It sure was. You know something else? What? I hate sweet numbers. (laughs) This podcast is for informational purposes only. The podcast is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. You should not use the information on the podcast for diagnosing or treating a health problem or disease or prescribing any medication or other treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider before taking any medication or nutritional supplement and with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this or any other podcast. Reliance on the podcast is solely at your own risk. Information provided on the podcast does not create a doctor-patient relationship between you and any of the health professionals affiliated with our podcast. 
Information and statements regarding dietary supplements are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to therein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.